Northwest. This is the Data Act webinar for agencies. And um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We have a, um, a very uh, intensive program with lots of different speakers, and I hope it will be help helpful for everyone. Um, before we get started, I want to thank the Association for Government Accountants who really made this program possible. So this was brought to you through a partnership between the AGA and XBRL US. Um, just a couple of logistical points before I introduce our first speaker. Um, you can submit questions through the, the, Q, the question uh, link that you see on your console. So you can submit questions throughout the program, and we're probably going to hold off on those questions until the end of the session, um, just because we have uh, so much to cover. But please go ahead and send those in, and, and we'll make sure that we, we address those. Um, we are offering CPE credit for the program today. And to get your CPE, you have to answer four poll questions that we will be uh, asking throughout the presentation. And uh, then we'll be sending out CPE certificates um, sometime within the next two weeks. So um, if you hadn't he haven't heard from us in a week, don't worry. Uh, we will be getting those CPE certificates out to everybody just be, be sure to answer the uh, poll questions that come in. OK, so just to get us started, I'm going to first introduce um, our initial speaker. And our first speaker is Herschel Chandler. Herschel is a principal with Information Unlimited. Um, Herschel has worked in the data science field for over 20 years. And he really has a passion for both the Data Act and the power of open data. Herschel is a frequent contributor on the Data Act GitHub. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Herschel. All right. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our first in a series of webinars on financial reporting data standards. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speakers and uh, Jim Dutch. Our first speaker is Christina Ho. Christina is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Accounting Policy and Financial Transparency at the Department of Treasury. The Department of Treasury is a lead agency responsible for Data Act implementation. Christina is going to tell us a little bit about the Data Act. Uh, following Christina is Eric Cohen. Eric is one of the original founders of XBRL and the creator and chief architect of XBRL's Global Ledger. Eric serves as CWC's XBRL Global Technical Leader. Eric is going to tell us about uh, how the XBRL standard relates to the all-important Data Act. Tim Gritton is the Deputy CFO at the Small Business Administration. In addition to financial management, he also has a background in performance management and data analytics. Tim is also an active member of Treasury's and OMB's Data Act Interagency Advisory Committee. Tim is leading the Data Act pilot, so he'll give us some insight into what an implementation could look like. Eric will rejoin the conversation along with Mark Montoya to talk to us about why this matters in the next few steps. Mark Montoya works in data strategy for the Division of Insurance and Research at the FBI. Mark is responsible for directing complex statistical analysis on banking industry trends and conditions. Mark has contributed to the Financial Stability Board's Global Legal Entity Identifier Initiative and has co-authored papers concerning legal entity identifiers. Mark was one of the original founders of the Central Data Repository, an XBRL-based financial reporting collection system shared by the Federal Reserve Board the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, and, of course, the FDIC. Mark has been involved with XBRL since 2001. Tom and Thomas Hood will then offer a case study in standard business reporting. Tom Hood is CEO of the Maryland Association of CPAs and the Business Learning Institute. Tom has been advocating for XBRL and the concept of standard business reporting for more than a decade. The Maryland Association of CPAs case study of their XBRL global ledger implementation was featured in the Journal of Accountancy and instrumental in the testimony before the House of Representatives in the passage of the Data Act. Thomas Hood is the XBRL practice lead at SCNA3. Thomas's involvement with XBRL started when he implemented an XBRL solution for internal reporting at the Maryland Association of CPAs. Thomas has presented at XBRL US and XBRL international conferences on the internal use of XBRL and on standard business reporting. And Thomas can be found on Twitter at the real Tom Hud. So as Michelle said, we have a full day today, uh, a full webinar today of data. So we're going to turn it over to Eric, uh, she's going to Christina Ho to talk to us about the data. Christina? Thank you, Herschel. And um, 
welcome everyone to the webinar and I um, really am very excited that this will be a, a helpful webinar for those of you who are involved um, with the Data Act implementation in any form. The Data Act does three important things that I would like to highlight first. First, it expands USAspending.gov to include summary level agency expenditures not only contracts, grants, and other financial assistance awards. Second, it requires that we develop consistent data standards for the data reported to the public. Third, it has a goal to improve the quality of the data to make it more useful to a wide variety of audiences. Our goal for the data implementation is to provide better data that will lead to better decisions and ultimately a better government. Our goal at the federal level is to provide more reliable, timely, secure, and consumable data for the purpose of promoting transparency, both facilitating better decision making and improving operational efficiency. Last year, Treasury conducted a pilot to explore the feasibility of leveraging industry data exchange standards to map federal financial data to a standard format and schema. This is a critical component to Data Act implementation because much of the federal data resides in non-interoperable systems across the government and they cannot be easily accessible. By labeling the data in its current location with a definition, in, in other words, metadata, it will allow agencies to report from the source and limit costly system improvement. So our first pilot successfully demonstrated that the financial information could be tagged with a digital label by mapping the data to a schema represented in XBRL format. Treasury released, uh, and NOMB released a baseline version of the Data X schema on May 8th. And that schema includes a subset of the uh, data elements required by the Data Act. And that's our first um, iteration. And we are now working on the next iteration that will include award level information uh, for the next release of the schema. I want to thank XBRL US and AGA for sponsoring today's webinar that will explore the use of XBRL for the Data Act and other case studies in government. Thank you. And I will turn the time back over to Herschel now. All right. Thank you, Christine. We appreciate that. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to seeing the next generations of your data standards on the uh, Federal Transparency GitHub site that we'll be talking uh, about in a few minutes. Uh, so with that, let's turn it over to Eric Cohen, uh, who will talk to us a little bit about XBRL and how it relates to the data. Eric? Thank you, Herschel. Uh, you've just heard from Christina Ho about the Data Act and a little bit about the reasons for it, the requirements, timing, and impact. I'd like to speak about the potential for the recommendations published by XBRL International as satisfaction to those requirements. You may have seen the WhiteHouse.gov blog posting that Treasury has piloted uh, the, the Data Act leveraging XBRL. For the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to discuss briefly two of the XBRL recommendations, the XBRL specification and its modular extensions, and XBRL Global Ledger, uh, XBRL GL that you heard uh, that Tom Sood will be talking about, how they fulfill the technical requirements defined in the Data Act, what makes them distinctive, and then I'll end this somewhat technical session with links to the Data Act materials but I will stop at those links and not go into the content from a technical point of view. Next slide. We've heard what the Data Act calls for broadly within the more technical requirements or what you see here on the screen that we're going to be incorporating widely accepted common data elements such as those from an international voluntary consensus standards body, federal agencies with authority over contracting financial assistance, accounting standards organizations, a widely accepted, non-proprietary, searchable, platform-independent, computer-readable format that's consistent with and implements applicable accounting principles, that's capable of being continually upgraded as necessary, that's consistent and co comparable data as uh, the result, and has a standard method of conveying reporting period, reporting entity, unit of measure, and other associated attributes. 
Next slide. XBRL is a global voluntary consensus body developing recommendations that fulfill these requirements. Globally accepted by regulators and businesses, heavily involving the accounting profession with extensibility and maintainability by design and formalizing the attributes explicitly set out by the Data Act. Next slide. XBRL uniquely formalizes those requirements designed for multidimensional business reporting and financial data. The XBRL specification defines how to capture every reporting concept, definitions for them, interrelationships between them, descriptions, as well as report level content, such as the reporting period, entity, unit of measure, and other attributes. XBRL also defines how to create standardized and shareable business rules and provide pointers to authoritative and practical guidance. The graphical representation that looks a little bit like a snowflake on the screen illustrates the specification and what can be captured for every reporting concept. Starting on the left and moving clockwise, captions and definitions for different purposes and language requirements, presentation order and hierarchy, special interrelationships, linkages to related regulations, pronouncements and guidance, automated business rules and validation checks, reporting attributes, and some simple calculation relationships. Which items sum up to others? Herschel, uh, can you give us a, an idea on how we might apply this in the Data Act environment? Yeah, sure thing, Eric. So uh, here's how an XBRL link-based specification could apply to uh, a government concept. We're starting here in the center. The element shown here is the current total funding obligation amount on award which is abbreviated in the center hexagon shape. That concept would be used to tag a fact that needs to be reported. The XBRL standard uses link basis to explain that fact. When the number 200 is tagged within this concept, stakeholders know that the label for the value is current total funding obligation amount on award, which you can see in the labels box to the left of the hexagon in the middle. Rotating down on the screen counterclockwise, you then see the calculations link base. Users know that the calculation for that class is the sum of total amounts of Continuing to the right, counterclockwise, the context shows that the fact is in U.S. dollars for fiscal year 2016. Next you see the XBRL formula specification provides validation for that fact to test the accuracy of the information reported. Moving up on this diagram from formulas to the box labeled references, this is where specific government reference material may be used to further define that fact. The definition box provides the agreed upon description of the concept, and finally the presentation's link base at the very top helps to explain how this fact is related to other facts that must be reported. That's an idea of what the concept will look like in government. Eric? Great. Thank you for that, Herschel. Now, the X of XBRL is about its maintainability and upgradability from tailoring the definitions and terms for local use to version management. The XBRL specification is ready for Data Act definition activities. Next slide. Now, some of the Data Act requirements that aren't fulfilled by the specification itself are fulfilled in another one of the recommendations from XBRL International that was developed using that specification, XBRL's Global Ledger, also known as XBRL GL where the specification focuses on the syntax requirements, XBRL GL is a standardized and holistic framework to fulfill those other Data Act requirements, the semantics. Developed by an international voluntary consensus standards body with broad participation and vetted by accounting standards organizations and consistent with accounting principles. Next slide. XBRL GL is a standardized, holistic, generic, global framework for representing general ledger and sub-ledger details. It's being used for business-to-business -business reporting, business-to-government data transfer, and government-to-government -government data exchange, and is unique in usefulness across a wide variety of reporting requirements, and helping organizations with internal requirements as well as doing that external data exchange. Next slide. What makes XBRL and XBRL GL distinctive the XBRL specification and XBRL GL are openly and internationally developed, royalty-free, extensible by design, widely deployed, and uniquely meet the Data Act requirements as written, open, international, extensible, widely deployed, uniquely meeting the requirements. 
Next slide. Now, as we noted before in a blog found at whitehouse.gov, the Treasury's website and elsewhere, it indicated that it had performed pilots based on XBRL. On the screen and in the materials you will receive, you will see links to the Data Act pilot data elements and schemas. You can see them here on the screen and you'll, of course, don't worry about taking notes right now. You'll get these uh, directly. Uh, XBRL US does plan to describe these links and their content in much more detail in the next part of this webinar series. So, Michelle, I think we were very effective. Uh, back to you for the first CPE mm -hmm. question. Great. Thanks very much, Eric. Okay, I'm going to put a poll question up on the screen here. Just give me a second. Okay. Okay. So you should be able to see a poll question right now. And uh, you will need to respond to this in order to get your CPD credit. Just click on the button that seems most appropriate. Okay, so um, it looks like we got 90% voted, so just give it a second more. <clears throat> okay. All right, we're going to go on to our next poll. Okay, so here's the poll question. The Data Act calls for a standard that meets these requirements. And just post your uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so post your responses. We'll do two poll questions right now, and we'll do two a little bit later in the during the session. Okay, we're up to 92% voted. So if, uh, just give it a second more. Okay, I'm going to close the polls now. Okay, great. Okay, thanks very much for uh, responding to the poll question. I'm going to move on to our next speaker. And the next speaker is Tim Gribben. Tim is Deputy CFO for the Small Business Administration. And he's going to give us a sense for what will the implementation look like. So Tim? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. You might want to speak up a little bit. Okay. That's perfect. Thank so you. I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak about SBA's participation and what we've learned from the Data Act pilot. Uh, looking at the concept of the data broker. And I don't know if you have, you want to move to the next slide where it shows some questions that I've put together of things that I think that agencies should ask themselves as you go through this process. And I'm going to structure my, my talk about around these four things. And starting with the first one is, is how you gathered your team of experts. So have you talked to the systems people, whether they be financial systems or part of the 
CIO's office, the, the budget people, the program people, to be able to go to that next step, which is starting the data mapping process. When SBA started this process as part of the pilot, there was there was really nothing to to help us. There was no template, and we mapped a the so we took the 57 data elements and we mapped them in Excel to where we would find them specifically in our financial system, our source financial system as a record, as well as the management award systems to be able to provide that information to Treasury so that they can look at how they would be able to use our mapping to where you would find these data elements and what we call them in our systems and be able to test out the concept of the broker. Now that, I have to admit, that's, it, it's hard work. It's hard work to determine where all the data resides and to be also to figure out when you look at what the, the definition really means and how that meaning translates into what you've defined it in your agency. That took us a few weeks to do that. Now, we're now one step ahead because Treasury has provided templates to be able to do this data mapping. And, and so that first part of doing the data mapping is what helps inform you of what you need to do for the rest of the process. And that leads to some of these other questions because it, so by, by, by starting that data mapping process, and one of the things you could do is you could take a stab at starting the process by even taking up to five awards from grants or from contracts and then seeing how that process works with five actual awards. That's, that's how we did it. Now we started with grants. We started with something that was common to most agencies. So SBA has basically all the different products, grants, contracts, loans, insurance, uh, but we started with the, the grants and through the data mapping process is what will help inform you of what you're capturing and what you're not capturing and that's what's key. So you have to determine the, by, by looking at what you are capturing, okay, and is the definition consistent? And if not, then you have to figure out, well, what are the things that I might have to change in order to be consistent with the definition as defined now with the Data Act? And for things I'm not capturing, to figure out, well, how are we going to capture that? And that's going to the source award system to capture it there so that it can feed through to the financial systems and what modification has to be made to the communication protocols between those systems in order to pass the data up. Uh, so one of the things that I know is a challenge for some agencies is the award ID. Now that's something that we at SBA, we've, we have already been passing the award ID from the management system and, and into the financial system, but I know that sometimes that gets truncated in some agencies, and if that's the case, you have to look at, well, what will you do in order to get the full award ID? And then what's the cost of modifying that? And then also I know that in some agencies, not all of the management systems are connected to the financial system in an automated way. And what's it going to take to, to to either create to create those linkages or to create some process that's going to get the data from the source systems into the management systems, and so uh, there there are some things in our example that, of SBA that we have to look at things that we're not currently capturing, like the program activity. So we capture program activity, but we have defined that in a different way, and while that data element has not completely been defined yet. We're looking at how are we going to redefine program as we call them in our financial system so that it would be consistent between the award system and the financial system and the way that we report it for the, the data act. And then we also have to look at some of the linkages that we've created between our, our award system. So we use a COTS product, which is PRISM, to to record our grants awards as well as our contract awards, and but yet we 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 have linkages from the award system to the financial system, but we don't have the linkage back from the financial system to the award system for 
payment processes, as an example. And there are also other things that we have to, to take into account and, and still has to be defined as those things that we give to assured services. So we, we use the uh, HHS for some of our grants awards and we use Department of Interior for some of our acquisition awards and, and how they record the financial transactions is slightly different than how, how we do it and how we record them in our system. So those are some things we're still trying to figure out. And, um, but, but as part of the pilot, what we were able to do is to, by testing out the concept of the data broker. So the, the concept of the way I originally had it defined in my mind was something that was a system that was going to sit within our firewalls. So it was open source software that would sit in our firewall and we would direct the broker to where these data elements reside in our financial and our source systems. And what we've learned through the pilot is that that concept is going to be complicated because even though we're using COT softwares, we're, we're, as I said, we're using Prism, we're using Oracle for our financial system, but yet there's still some customization involved. And the route that Treasury is going down now, with, which is creating these flat files that we will would submit uh, to the broker that would then do the data translation and the data validation is, is something that has addressed a lot of questions that we originally had as part of the pilot and it's something that we are thinking is going to, we definitely think this is the right way to go and it's something that we can definitely work with. Um, going to question number three, this is something I put on there because what I've discovered through my experience of working on the Data Act is all the data that, that we're currently submitting to USA Spending and are you able to reconcile that to your financial system? Now we know, we, we've gone through this process over the last couple of years to look at our, our transmissions to USA Spending and how does that reconcile to our financial data and in the beginning it didn't reconcile because we weren't sending all transactions over there if it was under 25,000 but now we are we have been sending everything over but there are still some things that fall out what we found is though we are able to reconcile between the two systems since we are able to reconcile that says to me for the Data Act purposes the reconciliation and the verification between our awards and how we report them in our financial system is something that we understand and we can explain. If it's not something that you understand or can explain, then that's where a lot of work is going to be involved in trying to figure that out. Which leads to that next step when you talk about the data quality plan and the data verification process. While the broker will do some valid their verification. My understanding of the broker now is it's going to, to, to verify that the transmission or the flat file is in a form that can be accepted by the broker. So if you think about it from the concept of the broker, it's, it's, it's looking for this flat file so that it can turn it into structured data that then can be output and be, and be used in a structured way. And so it's going to look for our is the flat file in the right format? Does, is, are the right fields supplied? And it's going to validate that that exists, but it's not going to be able to validate that it's reconciling between your awards and your financial system. That's something that will have to be done by each agency in-house, and they're going to have to be able to, to certify that the data is, is, is uh, complete and if it's not complete why it's not complete because we know there are things that are going to fall out and how are we going to report those like some things that can't be provided in a in a USA spending type format because of let's say privacy issues so the uh, what we but what we've learned through this process is that uh, that that even though not everything is defined, that we are glad we started when we did because we found out what was falling out. And in the very beginning of this process, we thought that the cost to implement the Data Act was going to be systems related, that we were going to have to invest in a lot of systems to create a data warehouse. And, and, and that's something that we've proved, at least to our, in our instance, is not the case. But what we have 
figured out. And we all have to submit our implementation plans to OMB in September. So that the cost is going to be the support to translate the data as it currently exists in our systems into these flat files. And the, really, the cost I see is of the validation process. How do you close those loops between what you're currently capturing and what you're not capturing? So as I said, we don't have the, the needed investment in the financial systems because we learned we're capturing what we thought we were capturing. And, and Treasury was able to reproduce that on their end by, by us giving them our data mapping. They were able to recreate our structure. But what it's, what it's not going to be able to do, as I said, that whole validation and verification process. And there are unanswered questions. We still can't figure out exactly what that's going to cost because we were trying to figure out from an awards to a financial statement standpoint, what are the lines in GTAS that we should be reconciling to? And what are the things that are, like, as an example with our loan program is one I talked about, there are certain things that can't be reported for privacy reasons. How do we report that and reconcile between the things that we are reporting and the things that we can't report, but yet we can report on a summary level? So those are things that we haven't tackled yet and we're still trying to figure out. But, um, but my, my message is this, start now, it's going to take some time, but it's worth the effort. And with that, I'll pass it back over. Great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for those valuable lessons learned uh, as, as you lead the way uh, in, in the effort. And I'm very glad to hear that you've got such a great focus on, on data quality and data governance. I think it's very important in any, uh, any of these integrations uh, of data. So, so far we've heard about the Data Act. Uh, we know a little bit about what it is. Uh, we've heard about the XBRL standard and how it relates to the Data Act. And we've heard from Tim on you know, what the implementation could look like uh, for you as you start to implement this in your agency. Next, we have the all-important question, what's in it for you? Uh, we're going to turn it over to, to Eric and Mark to answer that question. Eric? You're exactly right, Herschel. And thanks, Tim. Uh, Tim did offer many questions that agencies need to ask, and we're adding that one more, what's in it for me. Uh, Mark Montoya and I are going to discuss some of the potential benefits to you and others that come along with this effort. Uh, these benefits have been seen in a number of other areas where standardization has proven to be much more than a mere compliance exercise. The standardization and simplification have led to benefits through a supply chain now practically brought together through those standards. Next slide. Uh, that changeover from a compliance burden only to full supply chain integration has a long history in many areas. I'm just going to touch on one here, uh, the retail environment and the UPC, Universal Product Code, barcode you see in products at the supermarket. With the pressures of just keeping up with what needed to be done from keeping track of inventory to dealing with the checkout, retailers found the UPC revolutionized their processes first within the store after applying the UPC themselves and then back through the entire supply chain as standardization was moved back to the source. Next slide. The, the pain point should be pretty familiar to, to m many of you on this call. Dealing with manual processes, being held captive by software developers, dealing with the islands of automation, the difficulty of getting ad hoc reports, and just the high cost to maintain the systems, these are very common and felt by all. Next slide. Now, it was a little bit to the opposition of parties, both within and without the organization, but the first UPC barcoded grocery cart full of food was scanned on June 26, 1974. The very first item pulled out of that cart, all of which were barcoded, of course, was a, a pack of juicy fruit gum, that pack now being in the Smithsonian. The benefits within the store, where the labels were added manually, and eventually through the entire logistic chain, were substantial. You can see them on the screen, nine times increase in product diversity, 17 billion in annual cost reduction, and, and many, many more. Next slide. The benefits of standardization included broad reduction in human error, reduced employee training time, improved inventory, better information exchange and decision making, not having to maintain manual uh, books and records, uh, just really streamlining the entire process. Next slide. The benefits obtained within the store were simplified. 
as the standardization moved back from being applied within the store, back through the distribution channel, and all the way back to the original manufacturer. In the same way, it's the goal of XBRO designed to facilitate standardization of data from the reports at the end back to the original point of entry with potential benefits shared throughout. Next slide. The same potential holds here. Dealing with those pain points, now being able to have increased efficiencies, better and more accessible data, better quality and decision making. Mark Montoya is now going to discuss how standardization with XBRL brought benefits to the FDIC. Thank you, Eric. So today I want to present FDIC's use of open data standards to collect financial reporting data from 6,400 financial institutions. Financial reports we collect are called the quarterly reports of condition and income for all banks. The report is also known as the call report. The call report data are key data for much of the work we do at the FDIC. Call data is used in bank examinations, risk premiums for banks, and to provide the state of the banking industry to the public. I think you'll find there are many good nuggets to take away from my presentation today. Next slide, please. The Central Data Repository System is a centralized database for the collection, analysis, and dissemination of call report data. Operations for the CDR are, are also shared amongst three federal financial institution examination council members, or the FFIEC, which include the Federal Reserve Board, FDIC, and the Office of Control of the Currency. CDR makes use of XBR for data validation, data exchange, data dissemination, XBRO formulas are used to ensure the data of the financial data received by reporting banks are correct. XBRO is also used for data exchange in the form of reporting requirements or taxonomies and quarterly data. CDR also offers current and prior quarter reporting requirements and bank data in the XBRO format. Next slide, please. Three key business issues needed to be addressed with this, with this new system. The FFIC agencies had separate systems to collect the same financial report. The FFIC agencies each distributed their own reporting requirements for the same financial report. And the financial data was not available internally to the public in a timely manner. The agencies decided to collaborate and develop a centralized repository to collect financial reports with a focus on standardization to improve data quality. The central data repository has five key components. Their data exchange, their collection, validation, analysis, and dissemination. The reason to update this financial, existing financial system was a business decision and not a technical decision. Next slide, please. Business-driven projects succeed because the subject matter experts understand how potential changes will affect their current business processes and are much more inclined to entertain a technical solution to a business problem they have identified. And with this being said, the project was 80% business decisions and only 20% technology. Next slide, please. The initial idea to update a 20-year-old financial collection system was met with much skepticism. The idea met resistance within each of the federal regulatory agencies because the existing call report system was part of the corporate culture. Many of the users of the call report identified themselves with this system. Each, it is safe to say that nobody likes change. If you say you do like change, you know, please have yourself checked by a local doctor because change is actually hard for everyone involved. That is why the FFIEC agencies dedicated a working group just to address the change management issue. Next slide, please. So this diagram shows the FFIEC's quarterly financial reporting cycle workflow and the interaction between all the stakeholders in the system. Can you click, please? Each quarter, the agencies develop and send reporting requirements to the software vendors. This includes the report form, report instructions, and data quality checks. Software vendors incorporate reporting requirements into their soft financial banking software. Next click, please. Bank level data quality checks are provided through the bank software and the banks submit their financial reports to the CDR system. Next click, please. The system then offers FFIEC agencies access to the data through shared services. And another click. The data is also made available to the public through a website and, or web service. Next slide, please. The standards are used through the quarterly call reporting cycle. Um, first click. Reporting requirements are exchanged with software vendors using the XBRL standard. Next click, please. The banks use vendor software to submit their quarterly financial reports to the FDIC in an XBRL format. Uh, third click, please. 
bank data is offered to the FFIC agencies and the public in an XBRL format. Use of standards like XBRL allowed the agencies to streamline the reporting process by explicitly defining reporting requirements in a taxonomy. No room for interpretation by the software vendors. And this by pre-validating the data at the bank and prior to the receipt within the CDR system. So let's dig a little deeper and I'll look and look at how open data, uh, standards are being used within the FDIC. I'm going to provide you a uh, use case study. Next slide, please. One more click, there you go. One more, ne next slide. So there are five key attributes to the system. XBRL will be used as an official standard for data exchange between the U.S. financial regulators, banks, software vendors, and the public. The system will collect financial data from at the time when the project started, 8,200 banks in the XBRL format. Third, the financial reports will be validated for consistency and errors prior to the data being accepted by the system. Number four, the system will allow financial analysts to review, comment, reject, and accept income and financial reports. And finally, the system will provide a mechanism to disseminate financial data to other internal systems and regulators, including the ability to distribute data to the, in XBRL format to the public. Next slide, please. So prior to using a common standard like XBRL, the FFIAC reporting requirements were sent to the software vendors in multiple formats, such as MS Word, MS Excel, and PDF. The FFIC agents agreed to use XBRL to exchange reporting requirements using software vendors um, because XBRL is an international standard, it's an open and non-proprietary standard, and it is the only XML-based reporting language. So the heart of the central data repository system is a common shared metadata management tool agency staff use to develop, maintain, and publish reporting requirements. This tool not only creates the XBRL-based reporting requirements, but also provides a mechanism to test data quality prior with prior period bank data and current period bank data. Next slide, please. The CDR system relies heavily on the use of data quality checks. These data quality checks are, math are mathematical formulas designed using the XBRL standard. Data quality checks allow data to be pre-validated prior to the data being received and accepted by a financial analyst. Data quality checks are incorporated into the bank software by vendors and are executed at the bank level as opposed to the regulatory financial analyst level. This allows the bank to take control of their own data quality. Before XBRL, financial analysts had to quote unquote call the banks for data corrections as there were numerous data errors. This is why the report is actually called uh, the call report instead of uh, the reports of condition income for banks with domestic offices and foreign offices because analysts always had to contact the banks for the data corrections. Next slide, please. FDIC has established three types of data quality checks. The first are validity checks, which looks for consistencies between line item numbers within a report schedule and between report schedules. Data not meeting these criteria must be corrected prior to being submitted and accepted within the system, CDR system. Number two, quality checks look for consistency between current period and prior period data. Data not meeting these criteria must be submitted with a text explanation before being accepted within the CDR system. And finally, reportability checks are quarterly defined checks executed through the bank software that tells the banks which financial data is required for them to report for that call quarter. Next slide, please. Bank software will have FDIC data quality checks baked into their software and the validation process. When banks fill out their call report data, checks happen immediately and provide error messages back to the bank. The bank must correct all reportability reportability and validity errors prior to the submission to the CDR system. Banks must also apply, apply explanations for their quality errors. When banks submit to the CDR system, the same data quality checks that they applied in their bank software are applied again at the CDR system level. The report will reject and not be stored if any errors are encountered. Next slide, please. The bank submission process is complete when a financial analyst reviews and accepts the report to the CDR system. A financial analyst may discover anomalies with the current and prior data and request the bank to submit amendments. At this point, communications is between the analyst and the banks directly. The CDR call report review and acceptance tool is a web-based tool that's accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and is shared by all FFIC financial analysts. Banks can submit amendments and, and corrections at any time. The CDR system also offers ad hoc reports and statuses of the call report cycle include a number of received reports, data quality check failures, and call report cycle completeness. 
bank data and reports are accessible in real time by managers and analysts during the call report cycle. Next slide, please. When financial analysts accept the call report, the data becomes final and is made available to the public within one hour of acceptance. Data is available in XBRL, CSV, PDF, and bulk data formats. Data are also available to agency in the form of data extracts. FDSC uses the data for internal applications and, and applications within the FDSC, such as our bank examination tool and enterprise application. Next slide, please. To give you an example of immediate benefits that we had when we used uh, open standards within our, within our project, 90, uh, the, we had cleaner data. 95% data. of the banks met CDR reporting requirements. Next slide, please. For data accuracy, 100% of the data received met mathematical requirements. That is, it passed all validity checks. So it came, we consider 100% clean. Next slide. And oh, hold on, faster data, and also the last thing, faster data uh, access. The data are also made uh, available within one hour as when the report's accepted in the system. So thank you for, my, uh, for uh, letting me present today. I'd like to turn it over to Tom Hood and Thomas Hood who will provide you another case study on the SBR project. All right, thank you, Mark. And Michelle, if you could go to the next slide. So I want to talk about what we're a uh, local-based, state-based nonprofit in Maryland representing CPAs. And you might be wondering what what are we doing about this SBR and XBRL, and what does a restaurant order wheel have to do with it? So it started with uh, watching, talking through all the issues around XBRL and the possibilities of improved government reporting, and we thought about it at the state level. And I met the guy who ran the Netherlands SBR project, Harmion van Berg, along with Eric Cohen, and they described how the data worked in the Netherlands from a government reporting perspective. So, so that gets to this idea of what is standardized business reporting, SBR. And it really does get to standardizing the data, simplifying it, and then working that across systems, and in fact, even across organizations. So if you imagine the restaurant order wheel, you know, they put the little check on and spin it around. Um, Harmion described it as, imagine the tax return today and where that goes. So a tax return to the state of Maryland has a lot of data and information about the expenses, revenue, all the things that go into making, calculating that tax, information about the business. Imagine if you could put that on the order wheel and when you send it to the government, the data is standardized so that the data that needs to go to the Comptroller of the Treasury could go there. The data that needs to go to the Unemployment Division could go there. The data that needs to go to the State Department of Assessments and Taxation could go there. You get the impression. And you heard some great examples of that by both Tim uh, and Mark, I think, and Eric as they talk about this whole idea of simplifying, standardizing data. And I would say, and by the way, less money. So we started to say, well, how could you actually do this? Like, could we actually standardize the data in our nonprofit? And how hard was that? And so we turned actually to my son, who at the time was a college student at Salisbury University. Go to the next slide. And let me talk about the possible impact. So these are real projects that have, that have gone on for the last almost decade, starting with the Netherlands at the top. They saved roughly $300 million by reducing the data needs and automating that data flow through the uh, order wheel. Uh, Australia saved about $800 million, and then uh, New Zealand, the bottom one, is $55 million. There are active projects now in Brazil, Canada, and lots of other countries that are showing this kind of impact, right? 25% reduction in the cost of all the people who have to file the data among these organizations, and then a, a 70 to 98% reduction in the redundant data. So our next challenge was, well, is this really feasible? Like, could we actually tag data from multiple systems at the MACPA and then see how we can actually use that productively? And I'm going to turn it over to Thomas Hood to talk about our case study. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the MACPA's use of XBRL Global Ledger. Um, to solve some of these pain points listed here. And while this isn't a, a case study on a standard business reporting program on a, you know, a state or country level, 
I think the benefits that we achieved uh, through using XBRL easily translate to, to what the benefits would look like if we were to use um, standard business reporting at the state level or even with the Data Act, right? So before I talk about the benefits, let's, let's kind of talk about some of the pain points that led us down the path of actually utilizing XBRL Global Ledger to solve them. So the main issue that we had at the MACPA at the time was that there were disparate systems with disconnected data, right? And that's a, a common theme that I'm, I'm, I know for a fact is common in many different organizations, right? And so ultimately, uh, to give you a little more insight onto to what that disconnect was, is we had a system called Microsoft Dynamics, which was our general ledger system that had all of the summary data for the MACPA. And that's where a lot of the reporting and analysis was done out of. Now, there was also another system called AMNet, among others. Um, this system in particular was used for a lot of the operational um, components of the organization, right? So that's where a lot of the detail was kept. So when people tried to perform analysis, they would start in the Microsoft Dynamics system, and then they would have to trace back all the way down to AMNet or down the information flow to really reconcile the numbers, right? And they were, so in effect, unable to drill down into that detail. Um, which, of course, led to that manual effort of trying to tick and tie numbers, copy and paste data between spreadsheets. And that, of course, led to a delay in analysis, right? And so that's where we, we looked at some of the SBR programs that were going on at the time, and we, we really saw the use of XBRL and how it could be applied internally for even a private organization. So the next couple of slides that I'm going to walk through are a little bit technical. Um, the main things that I want you to take away here, especially in these next two slides, this one right here, is the Microsoft Dynamics table structure. So if you look at the column headers up top, you can see the account num height, the account description, the journal entry, debit amount, credit, credit amount, and transaction date. If you take a look at those and compare that to the other system on the next slide, you'll see this is the table structure of the am.net system, right? And this is what XBRL is solving. This is the crux of the issue, is that you have these two different structured data sets in two different systems that make really the, the comparison between the two systems very hard, right? Even if you were to run Excel reports out of both the systems, it's still going to require a manual effort to either back out the summarized balances or get down into that detail. So if we go to the next slide. Again, this is a little technical, but just to get a high-level appreciation for what was done, if you look on the left, you'll see one of the source systems, and that's Microsoft Dynamics. You can see some of the same table headers um, that we saw on the previous slide. And if you look to the right, that's the XBRL Global Ledger Taxonomy, and that's what we're standardizing all of our systems to. And that is what helped us solve a lot of those pain points that we, that we touched on earlier, right? So if we go to the next slide, after standardizing the data, it was able to really help us give us insight into those numbers, right, because we could quickly drill down and see the information. Here's just an example of one of the downstream systems that we were able to uh, streamline data flow to after standardizing the data between the two systems. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So, you know, what did we actually achieve by using XBRL and, and specifically XBRL Global Ledger? Well, we were able to tag all the transactions in the MACPA between, of course, the two main source systems I mentioned as well as some other ones, right? And this, in effect, enabled us to drill down into those financial statements, which we normally could not do. And that helped us reduce the manual effort that existed, of course, with data reconciliation and all the things that go into that. And that, of course, streamlined reporting and analysis because now all of our data is in that one consistent standard format all of our reporting can be done out of that one data set. Um, one important and kind of interesting thing I, I want to note is that we were able to leverage the, the current processes and systems, right? Mm -hmm. Dynamics and AMNet, they were both good systems. They did what they needed to. So we were able to keep those in place, systems that the staff were already familiar with. They were allowed to keep using those systems and interacting with them in the same way. However, we just layered in XBRL in between them to streamline that communication and standardize it. And that's where we're able to now run our reporting out of, on top of that, that now standard data set. So 
again, while this, this case study wasn't at a, at a state level, I think it, it translates pretty well, and you can really see how, you know, the, the benefits that we reached through using XBRL um, that some of you will reach using the Data Act and how uh, a standard business reporting uh, program at the state level could also achieve some of the same benefits. Um, all right. Herschel, back to you. Hi, it's Michelle here. We actually have a couple of CPE questions before we move back to Herschel. Um, and thanks, thanks, Tom and Thomas, very much. Um, I'm going to bring up uh, two more polls. Okay. So hang on one second. Okay, so the question is, which of the following is not true about XBRL GL? So just click on the appropriate button and uh, record your entry in order to get CPE. And while we're doing this, I just want to remind everyone that you can submit questions by clicking on the question uh, link on your console and we'll be uh, following up with questions in just a couple minutes here. Okay, we're almost done with the poll question session, so please make sure you get your vote in. Okay, I'm going to close the polls now for that one. Okay, we're going to go on to our last polling question. This is on standard business reporting. So please record your vote again. And again, for those of you who've uh, submitted your poll responses, you will receive your CPE certifi certificate, certificate rather, um, by email within the next couple of weeks. So we're going to close the poll in just a minute here. So make sure that you post your response. Okay, I'm closing the poll right now. Great. Okay, thank you. And now we will go back to, I'm going to turn it back over to Herschel, who's going to give us our wrap-up. All right. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for those challenging CPE questions. I, had, I hope I got them right. Um, all right, so far we, we've, uh, today we've heard from leaders working on Data Act implementation, both from uh, the department, uh, a department responsible for the laws implementation in Treasury, and also, and, and I think very importantly, from an agency leading the way in pilot implementation at the SBA. Uh, we've heard a little bit about XBRL and its relationship to the Data Act, and I think most importantly we've heard that Data Act implementation is really much more than an exercise in statutory compliance, an exercise in following the law. If we do this, and we do this well, we get a lot of additional benefits, such as streamlined reporting, uh, the enablement of cross-government analytics. This is something that I, I think can be really transformational for the CFO organization across government. There's a lot of value here. Uh, I'll, I'll cap my summary there, because I'm going to leave some time for questions. Uh, next slide. Uh, we want to let you know that we are here to help. This is the first in a series of webinars. We're going to have two more, one coming up on creating intelligent data. Uh, we don't like unintelligent data, so we want some smart data, as well as one on using structured data. Uh, we're going to send you all the materials that we talked about today. So in the interest of time, Michelle, what questions do we have? Great, Herschel. Thanks very much. Um, 
Okay. Actually, we have. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, we have a question for for Tim. Tim Griffin at SBA. Can you elaborate on the reconciliation of financial data to USA spending? Uh, was it just at the award ID and uh, I believe OBS? I, I think maybe obligation level. Were there other fields included in the reconciliation? And so this is kind of a long question, Tim. So. What about items like payroll that do not go through the agency award system, but would of course be included in the agency's obligation total in the financial systems? Yeah, so you know what I was talking about that I was, I, I should have clarified, I was referring to reconciliation of what's currently reporting, uh, reportable to USA spending. So, and, and that is looking at it from the obligation standpoint, but it's still, it's, that my, my point was that what we're reporting to USA spending is what we're obligating. And yet, they're, they're, and agencies are not always reconciling what they're reporting from, because a lot of times the reporting is done through the management award system. And so there are, there are things that happen on the financial system that brings it out of reconciliation and knowing what that is. And so and it, it could be a, as simple as there are things that are not being transmitted that should be. You know, in our case, we found that we had added a, a, a loan program. We had a new CFDA number for it, and we neglected to include that as part of the, the extract of the system to transmit to, to USA spending. So we showed it in our financial system. We weren't showing it in USA spending. That's an example of one. Or there's other times where we reported an obligation through the, uh, the, the award system, but then in a back office process, we did a manual correct correction through a journal voucher, which was done at, on the financial statement level, but not in the award system because it wasn't done in the source system. So that was not then translated to, or transferred to USA spending. So by understanding the obligation side will give you insight into the payment side, which is a whole a whole another avenue. But on the payment side, uh, originally I was really concerned about how are we going to match all of these payments to the award level, and in some cases it's not possible. But we also decided that that's okay because some of the payments is going to are going to have to be shown at the summary level. So payments as it's reflected in the financial system and down the road we can see which of those can be mapped back to the award and which ones cannot be. So does that, do you think that addressed everything that part of components of that question? Um, I think it did. Herschel, do you think that addresses the question? No, absolutely. Sounds good. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions. I know we're running a little bit over here, but um, this is a question for Christina. Um, data quality historically has been a concern on USA spending. Uh, there is a lot of data that already exists on USA spending. How will the new Data Act data be integrated into that platform while maintaining historical quality? Yeah, um, we are actually addressing the, the data quality um, issue in several different ways. Uh, number one, by um, requiring agency to create the linkage between the financial system and the management system, we are requiring agency to uh, source the amount from their financial system. So the financial systems in today's uh, at agencies are all subject to existing internal control over financial reporting, so that's one way. Second way, secondly, we are going to provide validations as part of um, a, a tools to help agency validate the data. And then lastly, I think it's more of a, um, how strategically we address the, the issue of data quality. Um, data quality, to some extent, um, up to this point, including how we're doing USA spending today, uh, the burden of the quality resides on, on data consumer because they're the one consuming the data and they care about data quality. Uh, if we align um, data consumer and data provider uh, strategically, uh, and if the data provider are also consuming their data to use for their uh, part of their business process or decision-making process, 
uh, then they will also care about the quality of the data and will be able to see if there are some uh, data quality issues and can fix that um, uh, timely. So those are three ways that we are addressing the data quality in the new um, and, and better future of the data. Christina, thank you. Um, another question that we got is about the CPE questions and what the correct answers were for the CPE questions. And we'll, we'll rather than go through those right now, we'll, we'll, email, we'll email that out to everyone. We will be sending an email to everybody, as, as Herschel mentioned, uh, including you know, a link to the replay and uh, some other uh, backup materials that may be helpful to you. Um, another question that we received for uh, Tim is, Tim, you mentioned an open source broker tool. Um, what tool is this, and how can we find it? You know, that's the tool that that we've been working with Treasury on. So, uh, so the 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 broker is is being created out of open source software, so that there isn't any concern about proprietary software or or the charges to it. Right now, Treasury is in the process of taking. Right now, the way the broker is designed, it really is you have to be a developer in order to be able to make the connections. So the work they're doing right now is, for lack of a better term, they're, they're webifying it. So they're turning it into a tool that users can use as opposed to only developers. And that time frame, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'd have to, I'd, I didn't bring that with me to, to know when, when that might be available. But there is, there is information about the, this, the pilot that we're working on, it's on the GitHub site. And you can go there and you can look at a number of the different questions. Some of the questions that were asked by the, the, the researchers working for Treasury, some of the questions were asked by SBA. And then, uh, so you could see some of them are technical. Some of the earlier questions aren't really relevant because we've moved past the early stage. But I would say, uh, and I don't know if Christine might, might know uh, that the, the when the broker might be available. Yeah, Tim, thank you. Um, so we, be, because it's open source, we're definitely sharing the broker code because our intent is for uh, reuse, uh, whoever needs to use that. So we're actually uh, putting the broker code uh, on GitHub uh, and as we actually refine it and, and further develop it, uh, our intent is to really make that accessible uh, to whoever needs to use it. And uh, just like Tim said, we we actually continue building out the broker, uh, but, but the code itself now, we actually have put that on GitHub. People can look at it and, and play with it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tim and Christina. Um, I think we're, we're really out of time, but I'll ask uh, one, one last question. Um, that came in, is the idea that agencies will be submitting their data in XBRL, or can agencies determine a format that is more convenient for them? So the schema is uh, represented um, in XBRL. In terms of how we get the data, uh, depending, at, our goal is to make it as easy for agency as possible. So if there are formats, let's say if some agency, they want to for a CSV file, if that's easier, we want to work with that. Um, our ex it's the schema is represented in XBRL, but there are other formats that we can um, support in terms of taking it uh, in the local format of the um, of the the agency system, local system, because the intent is to minimize system changes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, well, I want to thank all of our speakers um, so much for joining us today and uh, for spending a lot of time preparing um, your materials. And, um, you know, in particular, I want to thank Herschel for walking us through this whole presentation and, and kind of hosting the event. Um, and, and I also especially want to thank um, the Association of Government Accounting for partnering with us on this and on our future webinars. And uh, please watch your email because we will be uh, sending out information about um, you know, some, some background material, including a glossary of terms and a background on XBRL, and uh, also information on upcoming webinars that, again, will offer CPE credit and will be free to, to all attendees. Thanks very much, everyone, for your time. <laughs>